Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. And rescueswimmershop.com, official high quality apparel featuring the silhouette. Breeze Eastern, they dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help your helicopter training. They train daytime, nighttime, aerial firefighting, hoist, longline, fast rope, rappel, and more. They can assist your program with standardization and safety checks or just an FAA annual refresher. With the certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew, they are ready to help your agency keep up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. Plus, right now, SR3 is offering 10% off anything in their web store with the promo code, all capital letters, Real Rescue, R E A L R E S Q. Plus, they are offering 10% from their partners, Petzl and their equipment, all you got to do is send an email to info at sr3rescueconcepts.com. Mention this podcast, The Real Rescue Podcast, and they'll take care of the rest. 15 years ago, photographer and Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 526, Chris Razor, created an iconic photograph. This photograph depicted the silhouette of a helicopter rescue swimmer reaching down for an outstretched hand in need against the American flag backdrop. The image went viral and became a symbol worldwide for the rescue community and the people they help. Its wild popularity inspired Chris to launch RescueSwimmerShop.com, a web store offering official high quality apparel featuring his evocative image, The Silhouette. T-shirts, hats, patches, and stickers featuring the silhouette are available at RescueSwimmerShop.com, including the flagship design, So Others May Live. Follow Chris and his story on Instagram with the handle at RescueSwimmerShop. And if you are a rescue swimmer, support rescue swimmers, or just tell people you are one at the bar, this gear is definitely for you. When you get to the website, rescueswimmershop.com, enter the promo code, all lowercase, one word, rescue, R-E-S-C-U-E, for 10% off your order. Our next guest that joins us, he talks about his time in the U.S. Coast Guard, as well as his time being a law enforcement officer. Please welcome United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 139, Mr. Dan Hossel. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Real Rescue Podcast. Today, I've got another brother with me, United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer, number 139, yep, Mr. Dan Hossel. What's up? What's up, my brother? How you doing, man? It's good to see you. Thanks good, for coming good. on, dude. This is- Oh, again, thanks for having me, man. It's just humbling. I'm honored to be on here with all these legends. Wow. A couple of them, right? I mean- Gosh, you, you sit here and listen to like two or three of them. And you're like, oh, I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. It's so uh-huh. funny because like you've said before, I mean, 
it's it's all up to the SAR guys who gets what calls, and we're all trained. But fact remains, these guys did it. They're awesome. Yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm humbled every time I get one of you guys on. You know, and and to listen to everybody else's stories too. Like, you know, even in my in my world now, I. I just heard a story not too long ago from one of the newer swimmers. He's rescue swimmer number 999 of all numbers, <laughs> but he just had, that doesn't a, make me feel old at all. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, it makes you feel any better. I'm like right in the middle. I'm the middle man right there. <laughs> you are, but you know, <laughs> yeah, he's got an amazing story and, and you know, like nobody really hears about it. And that's why I love bringing this to the table and, and allowing everybody that platform to really, to share their experiences and stories because they're pretty friggin' awesome. So yeah. So again, cool, thanks cool. for coming. Yeah. Quite welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So um, being, I know a little bit about you, uh, please introduce yourself to the world and kind of tell a little bit who you are, how you get into the coast guard and how you became a rescue swimmer. Okay. Uh, I had to bounce around a little bit on that one, but um, all good. Yeah, also, all right. Swimmer number 139. And I actually started my public service career, if you will, uh, when I was 14. 14? Um, what? 14. Come I on, man. I joined the rescue squad in Northern Virginia uh, when I was a 14, a new program. They just started, and they were letting young people on just to, to learn the background a little bit. And once I got on, I'm like, nah, I, this isn't enough. I want to be an EMT. I want to be involved. Wow. So I sort of put the state in a conundrum, you know, it's like, well, he's too young to be an EMT, but it wasn't really written that I couldn't be. Wow. So they, they finally said, all right, well, if he passes thinking I want, they let me, they let me be an EMT. And at 14 just, years old, at 14 years old, I passed and <laughs> actually did really well. And I was running rescue at 14 years old. Dude, um, that's that's impressive right there. Cause I remember when I was 14 and I was like mowing lawns and stuff. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Running my, EMT my cases. Wife always joke. Yeah, my wife jokes. She's like, when I like, well, when I was a kid, she goes, You were never a kid. <laughs> oh my gosh. But <laughs> so yeah, I got my my big start, you know, basically in uh when I was 14, you know, all through school uh running rescues accidents i was actually at the air florida crash in dc um the plane hit the 14th street bridge uh and then after that um i went into the coast guard which i'll circle back around on that one because that's sort of interesting how that all happened okay um i did five years as a swimmer and then actually got out and uh came on with dayton police department did patrol 10 years as a canine officer, five years on SWAT. And then after retiring from that, I did uh, contract uh, protection work for a couple of years. And then uh, just, you know, ran some other businesses after that. Holy so cow. So it's uh, pretty much public service for life. Wow, man, um, what a career. Good for you. <laughs> so yeah, back to how I got in the Coast Guard and a swimmer. Um, it's actually sort of funny when I was again uh, out of high school. Um, you know, I I wanted I actually wanted to be a police officer, but you know I had no college, no military background, and and they basically told me like, yeah, that ain't gonna happen. So um, I was trying to figure out what to do, and at the time <laughs> I was quite an adrenaline drunk junkie. Um, I, I was into skydiving, scuba diving, running into burning buildings. Yes. So I mean, like, I need something that I can do rescue work and still satisfy my adrenaline craze. So um, it, where I grew up, I mean, nobody heard of the Coast Guard. I didn't know the Coast Guard. So uh, my dad actually worked for the Air Force. And I looked and I'm like, I'm going to be a PJ. Yeah. So hey, rescue. I, yeah. Uh, so I went to the recruiter and uh, I talked to him like I went in. I'm like, I want to be a PJ. And he looks at me and goes, no, you don't. I'm like, uh, oh, lame. Yeah, I, I, I really do. I, just, I do. And he's like, no, you, you don't. And I'm like, I, I, I don't understand. Why, why don't I? And he says, I'm going to be honest with you. And, and I apologize to all my PJ brothers <laughs> up there, but this isn't for me. This is the recruiter's words. And uh, he said, 
the Air Force is looking for big gorilla, uh, big dumb gorilla type people to do that job, and that ain't you. And oh, I just sort of like man. drop my mouth, and I'm like, oh, um, okay. So I sort of left the recruiter's office, sort of dejected. I'm like, well, what now? So, you know, went back home and, and uh, a buddy of mine was telling me he just went into the Coast Guard um, to go to OCS. I'm like, Coast Guard? Huh. So I, I got a hold of him to send me a packet. And when I got my packet in the mail, on the front of this packet is a 52 with somebody hauling a litter into the door. And I'm like, okay, that looks cool. I got to do that. So yes. <laughs> I found a Coast Guard recruiter. Didn't even know there was one in our area. And I went in and talked to him. I'm like, look, this is my story. You know, this is my background. I wanted to be a PJ. They said, you know, it's not for me. But I saw this picture. I want to do this. I want to fly in helicopters. And he looks at me and goes, have I got the job for you? <laughs> And he said, the Coast Guard just started this new program. It's called the Helicopter Rescue Swimmer Program. And he told me about it. And uh, I'm like, all right, yeah, let's do this. Sign me up. So uh, I enlisted, went to boot camp, did my thing, uh, got sent down to Air Station New Orleans. And of course, at the time, they still weren't active yet. So didn't really get a whole lot of, you know, break into the swimmer world yet. Um, but every duty night I was out in the back of that 65 riding training flights just for the fun of flying. Nice. Um, but, uh, a neighbor of mine who was actually a DC there at the air station, we were just out running and working and PT and trying to get ready for school. Um, I had a guaranteed school cause of my ASVAB score. And, uh, nine months later on my way to East city for, for swimmer school and got there and, we were actually sort of a, a unique class because like you've heard from all the others, obviously uh, Pensacola was shut down temporarily right. because of the death and the summer school. So they were actually running the, the blue light specials when we got there. And so we were, we were being trained completely like they were at East city as swimmers. Uh, we went to Pataluma EMT school with the blue lights and then at the end, uh, Pensacola opened back up. So we ended up actually still going to Pensacola. Wow. So we yeah. got to do both sides of it. And because we'd done everything at East City already, um, we got down there to Pensacola and just kicked butt. <laughs> so awesome. Way to represent Coast Guard, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was so funny. It was funny because down there um, – it was uh, Steve Duhamel, Steve Duhamel, myself, and Gary Parsons uh, were down there, and uh, the three of us were kicking butt along with a Marine. A Marine was also down there, and he was doing so cool, and <laughs> cracked us up because he smoked like a chimney, man, and, and we'd get back from PT. He would get back from PT, and he would be, like, just coughing his brains out. <laughs> And he'd like hurry up and grab a cigarette and inhale that sucker and like, ah, oh, whoo. And he was perfectly fine again. <laughs> that is such but, an oxymoron to me. Like that, that I know, that, right? That does not compute <laughs> in my brain. I, I can't. I know. I'm like, that's not working, right? <laughs> no, I am not a smoker. I've never been a smoker. So I, I've seen guys do that. Yeah, that, that doesn't, that doesn't, it doesn't know, register to me. Like, None of us. I'm like, wait a minute. That that's backwards. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, we had a we had a great time down there in Pensacola, and then uh, came back and actually ended up getting stationed there at East City. Nice, which was awesome because you know obviously they were the beginning of it all, so they were fully operational, and and that's where it all got started. So you had uh, like Butch Fleiss was there, Mike O'Dell was there, um, all the the. Yep. Actually, Mike O'Dell was still stationed at East City when I got there. Oh, nice. Uh, our, our instructors, we had Butch Flyth, um, the late, great Joe Rodriguez, Joe Ungerfu, um, Gary Parsons, wow. um, Bill Rankin. I mean, it was a great group of instructors. They, 
they were phenomenal. And uh, I, I'm going to go into a bit later, but but Butch Flight uh, in pure Butch Flight Flight fashion, it's a tongue twister. Uh, <laughs> taught me my greatest lesson in life. Oh, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing that one. Come on. Yeah, yeah. But then at East City, I mean, we had again a bunch of awesome guys. You know, Todd Adams, Jim Sherman, Dana Saunders, Mike O'Dell. Uh, I mean, Ken Sullivan. I mean, there's, there's a great group of guys there and I know there's more. I'm just, but you know, yeah, um, no, you, you, so, you guys yeah, had a great. great shot for sure. Oh, we did. Like, we did. Yeah. Uh, Costa was there. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was awesome. It was a it, great place to get going. You know, we've said it multiple times just with all the other guys that I've talked to I, our brotherhood is there's, there's something about it. It's unique and different from anything else I've ever seen or heard. And it's it's pretty awesome so oh it is yeah. i mean there's a fraternity in the police department and i'll never put another you know officer down or whatever but it, it just doesn't even compare to the swimmer brotherhood it it's just, not the it same doesn't yeah no since, it's not since i've been out i tell some of the younger guys i'm like you guys don't get it yet you will like you're in it now <laughs> <They> will. <laughs> <laughs> you get out you'll be like man there was something about that so that's yeah, pretty cool yeah all right. So now you get into East City, you get qualified. Uh, hit me. Your very first case, because we all remember it, whether it's good or bad, whether it's nonchalant or not. What, what was uh, it? Well, that's the funny thing about my very first case is um, it, it was the first of many just like it that, you know, that that SAR alarm goes off, uh, you know, person in the water. And I'm like, this is it. This is what I've trained for. I am ready. Oh, God, I hope a shark doesn't eat me. <laughs> it's just the weird things that go through your mind. And uh, so, you know, we, we got all this stuff ready. We got in the helicopter. We took off. And that's when I realized that the whole lot of SAR cases involve a whole lot of flying in circles or squares with nothing at the end right and that was my first case <laughs> just thinking <laughs> this is it and then uh, followed up by monotony yeah <laughs> and nothing um so one of the things so that you're, was actually my, yeah one of the things you're actually referring to specifically is basically we get launched out on like a, a 406 e per, or not a 406 but a, like an e-perb and you're just doing patterns in the sky and you see nothing. You find nothing. You see nothing. It was a false alarm. And you've just burned like six hours of flight time staring at nothing. Yep. <laughs> Happens more yep. often than people know. Lots and lots of water. <laughs> yep. But we're coming. Just know if that alarm goes off, we're coming. So yeah, That's right. And, and if they are out there, we will find them. Damn right. But, uh, God knows we spent a lot of time looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, after that, I mean, that was my, my first actual SAR case, uh, or I should say alarm, not much of a case to it, but I, I'm sort of like Mike O'Dell. And when he said, you know, I mean, most of my, my cases, uh, if, if everything went as planned and we got there and we, we got people out or, you know, everything just went, it, it doesn't really stick in my brain much, you know, it yeah. was just like my actual first case where I did something. I honestly don't remember it much. It's, it's the cases where things didn't go well or, or it left that serious pucker factor, you know, in your yeah. mind. That's those are the ones that I remember, you know. Uh huh. I get that. I'll tell you what. We're going to talk about some of those, but before I get into that, I'd, I'd actually like to talk to, about one of them because, you know, um, I have a write up, pretty nice write up from uh, a rear admiral that was sent to you and your crew from a case, uh, which which I thought was cool. And and what's funny about this in particular one is you have so many more that are we're going to call it. Uh, more eventful in your life and in, in your mind, bigger cases than this one. And there was no recognition again for you guys in the very beginning, there was not a lot of recognition. It was like, Oh, we're just going out to do our job. Well, most people aren't deployed in 25 foot seas and snow blowing sideways. And you're like, what? This is not normal. <laughs> yeah. so, it's your job. 
Yeah. 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 It's my, it's my job. Right. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, so, so if you don't mind, let me read this real quick and I'd love to hear the backstory of this one. So uh, this is dated 20 May, 1991. I know with pride and am pleased to commend you for your performance of duty as an H3 air crewman and rescue swimmer on February, 17 February, 1990. Having already occurred 2.5 hours of flight time on two previous search and rescue cases, the day accumulated with a dramatic night rescue of three persons from a foundering pleasure craft off Mullet Shoals, North Carolina. All waterborne rescue assets had already been recalled due to extreme weather conditions, which also made the helicopters FLIR and radar ineffective. After the 40 minutes of searching, the alert air crew located the vessel with the aircraft searchlight. Despite the weather and no reference for hoisting, all three persons were safely recovered, treated for shock and hypothermia, and transported to the awaiting ambulance. Your stamina and ability to perform when all other assets were recalled are very noteworthy. Without your crew coordination and your individual professionalism expertise, three lives would have surely been lost in the frigid waters. You are commended for your outstanding performance of duty. By your meritorious service, you have upheld the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard. Signed, Paul A. Welling, Rear Admiral, U.S. Coast Guard. Dan, that's pretty badass. And if that's like the beginning <laughs> of a nonchalant career in the Coast Guard, holy smoke. G give us a rundown, man. What What is this case? Uh, and again, the write-up, it's... It's on how you write that report, but... Um, Thank you, Rear Admiral. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, basically, early evening, like he said, we had already gone out on a couple other cases. And uh, early evening, I mean, it was just... Sun was just starting to go down. I should say sun, because it was it was raining and foggy and miserable out. But uh, night was coming on. I'll put it that way. Roger that. Um, a family called in and... Basically saying that uh, grandpa and two kids went out fishing earlier in the day and hadn't returned. So <clears throat> they sent out uh, uh, you know, surface, you know, crews looking for them. And uh, the, the fog was rolling in really bad. So they launched us out and we started the search and uh, the temperatures were seriously plummeting. And uh, the fog was just super thick. I mean, it was... It was like a whiteout. You could barely see. Um, so we were trying to use the FLIR, but FLIR wasn't working great. The searchlight wasn't even that great because just the reflection. But um, what had happened was is they'd gone out in a fishing boat, and at some point their, their engine died, and they had sort of gotten uh, to a point that it was shallow-ish, but... They, they couldn't, they didn't have any, you know, ro you know, oars, no radios, no phones, uh, oh, no. none of that stuff. So they were just sort of stuck. So grandpa and the two kids were just huddled up in this small boat and trying to stay warm. And, um, and I was in the back of the H3 operating the FLIR. And, uh, you know, we were just trying to, to see as much of the, the coastline as we could uh, through the fog. And then I had picked up something. It was, again, it wasn't great, but it was a quick glimmer as we were flying by. I told the pilot, I'm like, you know, I think we just passed something. And then we were able to circle back around and, and we had to come down closer to try to, to get through some of the fog again. And then with the light, a combination of the, the light and the, the flur, we found that was, there was the boat and all three were in it. Wow. Um, and then basically, I mean, it was, there, there was zero reference. I mean, between the fog and the rain, there was just, there was nothing to see. So basically I kept, uh, while the flight mech and the, uh, radio men were, were working to do the hoist, I basically put the FLIR on, on them in the boat and was talking the pilot into maintaining, you know, uh, position using the FLIR over the boat and, you know, just for some kind of a flight reference. Wow. And, uh, you know, flight mech and the, the radio, uh, radio operator, I mean, did an awesome job. They hoist them all up with baskets. 
And then, uh, you know, we got them up inside and, you know, got them all wrapped up in blankets and started getting them warmed up. And, you know, we took them back to, uh, back to shore. So that's, wow. uh, you know, it was, I guess to me, again, me, for the pilots and stuff, definitely a bit more of a challenge they're flying without being able to see. Yeah. Uh, you know, me sitting in the back, you know, was sort of uneventful. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that, that's pretty much the case. Well, we'll give mad props to the pilots then. Good job, boys. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, I know it's like just driving a car in heavy fog. <laughs> yeah, right. In the helo in it. Holy smoke. With zero reference, too. You know, like when we go teaching places, you, you don't emphasize it enough. The pilot has to have something of reference, you know. So now you're kind of giving them that reference over ICS. Is That's, that's pretty legit right there. That's awesome. <laughs> Nice. All right. Well, yeah. keep us going, my friend, because you said that's the beginning of many, and, and that's not one that's that really stands out to you. So I, I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat. Let's do this. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll go over some that, at least to me, were, were a bit more uh, exciting. Um, one of the ones that sort of sticks out of my brain a bit is uh, – we got launched for a medevac on a fishing boat for a, a shark bite. Shark and bite. And a shark bite. You know, and a course, swimmer is like shark bite. You're like, you know, there, <laughs> you, there's exactly. always that, that little bit of like, oh, do I, uh, I know? <laughs> and you remember my very first case, yeah, the yeah. thought that went through I, my head. I don't want to be eaten <laughs> by a shark. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. I'm going on a confirmed shark bite. Awesome. And uh, the, the weather, again, it was I, late at night, maybe, and when I say late, it was probably like around 10 o'clock, I think. Um, bad, bad storm. I mean, the, the rain was, was heavy. The winds were heavy. So we get out there, and of course, you know, here's this fishing trawler rigging everywhere, and this thing is just rocking, rocking in the ocean, and... and um, you know, I'm sitting in the doorway. They're going to kill you. They're going to put me down, get him, you know, packaged up and back up. And I'm sitting there in the doorway and the, the flight mech's looking outside and he's like yells in my ear and he's like, man, are you ready for a wild ride? <laughs> I, I remember looking at him. I'm like, man, just whatever you do, don't put me in the water because somewhere down there's a pissed off shark. <laughs> so I'm like, Let's do this. <laughs> So I'm, I'm hooked up, I'm going down, and again, I mean, it's, it's just windy, and I'm like on the bottom of this thing like a pendulum, and the, the mast are flying all around and the rigging, and he's the flight mech, bless his heart, man, he's doing his best he can to like put me down in the middle of it all, and right about as I get towards the top of the mast, I mean, this is after several attempts trying to like get me between everything, and I'm starting to wonder, I'm like, is this going to happen? And he managed to thread the needle and he got me between the rigging and I'm going down. But at that time, I'm swinging one way, the boat's rolling the opposite way. Oh and boy. bam, oh. right into the right into the mast. And it was one of those things that like I smashed my face, my helmet, thank God. Um Dude. But I'm like, I don't want to do this again. So he's like, I grabbed onto the mast, unhooked, and just slid down the mast. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, One way or another, I'm getting down there. So I unhooked, I slid down the mast, and of course, you know, it's wet. There was no slowing down. I hit the bottom and then, you know, flipped backwards onto my back. I'm like, all right, whew, I made it. Are you freaking kidding me right now? Like, <laughs> no, serious. So, but the funny part was, is I go to get it up and I, I can't get up. I'm stuck. I'm like, what the heck? And, and a couple of the crew guys come right over and like, hold on, hold on. And when I hit and fell backwards, I landed in a pile of fishing hooks. <gasps> so all these hooks got caught on the back of my vest. So they're sitting there on hooking me and I'm like, Oh, this is a great start. <laughs> you know, I'm like, thank God the cameras aren't on. Oh you know? my God. So finally got on hooked. They take me down below 
and here's this guy who's got that that proverbial picture perfect big u-shaped missing out of his thigh um you know, what? The, what happened was they were fishing they hauled a shark on board and they were trying to like get it back off this the side but the thing whipped around and just took a huge chunk of this guy's thigh out so i you know i get him wrapped up pressure bandaged i uh, get back outside um you know I, I call for the litter they send the litter down and uh you know we we managed to again you know thread the needle going back up and <laughs> i'm like all right so this is going to be tricky getting back out of here so they they lowered the cable and basically i'm like i'm not going to do what i did before so i went to the very back of the boat and grabbed the hook as it came down hooked up and i'm like i climbed up on the back of the the edge of the back of the boat and and just jumped off the back as hard as i could and while i was still in the air the flight mech just jerked me up and zoom back up i went <laughs> So, uh, got back up in the helo and uh, kept treating my guy, and and we we got him to the hospital, and um, you know, that was that one. Wow! What so. the heck? <laughs> oh my! So. Just just imagine <laughs> you slide down the freaking mast. <laughs> Out of curiosity, do you remember how big the mast was? Because I'm thinking like a 40 foot mast, and you're starting at the top and on the way down. Is that an exaggeration, or what are we? It was, it, it was big. Uh, it was somewhere between 20, 30. All right. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll, go, big, with, I'll go with the double mast. Feet. Jeez, oh man. What so. the? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm getting down one way or another. I'm getting down there. Oh my so, God. So um, yeah, yeah. So that was that was one that I thought was, you know, stuck in my mind a little. <laughs> a um, little. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, we gotta I, get I the had to go back and, and I had to get a new helmet after that one. I'd actually cracked my I had to replace the shield in the front. Oh my um, god. Yeah, he just cracked it right up the middle. <laughs> Jeez. Um, so yeah, that, that was a fun one. Um, <laughs> and I'm trying to think. Uh, we, we another one that sort of sticks in mind. This was not not as funny. It's um, Mike O'Dell had actually talked about one sort of similar. Um, you know, I'll tell you who my my career, you know, on the rescue squad and, and as a swimmer and, and as a cop, the one thing that's hard, it's always hard is, is dealing with little kids. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, I don't care who you are, how hard you are, you know, if little kids, things don't bug you, you know, like, there's an issue, I think, but, um, we, there was a, one of those small little two lane bridges out on the sound there was a head-on collision and uh, a bunch of teenagers in a pickup truck had been drinking. They crossed the line and, and hit this little car with a mom and uh, uh, several kids in the back. Um, oh, man. And, uh, you know, the pickup truck, you know, the teenagers that were in the back of the truck, they got ejected. But you know how it is. I mean, most kids when you're drunk, I mean, most anybody when you're drunk, they, they tend not to get hurt that bad. Right. Um unfortunately during the impact uh it killed the mom holy cow and uh the the kids were all critical um problem was is because it happened right in the middle of the bridge ambulances couldn't get to them so they called us we were still in the h3 at the time so uh we got out there and uh luckily there was enough room there that we could we could land just by the accident and, uh, you know, at that point, okay, well, the teenagers are, they're, they're injured, but not serious. They can wait for the ambulance to, to finally get through. But again, the, there's three kids who are, were critical. I mean, they were, 
I mean, one is massive facial injuries. All his teeth were either shoved back up into his jaw or broke oh, off. Gosh. I mean, I had kids with uh, internal bleeding and injuries and broken bones. Um, so we packaged up the three kids, young kids, and put them in the helo. And, um, you know, we, we met it back them. So thank God for the H3 at the time. I mean, this thing was just massive in the back. So we had room for, you know, I had one in the litter and I had two on backboards and, and, you know, I, I'm back there. And, and again, thank God for the mech and the, you know, avionics men. I mean, they were doing their best to help, but I, I'm back there trying to bounce around between three critical kids, wow. you know, trying to, to help them. And um, one of them, you know, of course they're all, you know, they're calling for their mom. Yeah. And, you know, the ones like, you know, God, where's my mom? Where's my mom? I want my mom. And the last thing I want to do at the time is, is tell them, Hey, your mom's dead. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I lied, you know, it, it sucks, but it was like, Oh, your mom's fine. She's going to see you at the hospital, you know, cause my, my concern at the time was to keep them going. Yeah. Um, you know, which made me feel like crap afterwards, obviously, because, you know, they're, that's the one thing that's going to stick in their mind is, you know, hey, this guy lied to us. Right, you know? right. He said mom was fine and, and mom wasn't fine. Um, but, you know, we, we got the kids to, uh, we, we medevac them to a children's hospital. And, uh, you know, they're taking care of them there. But when we got back to the air station on that one, I think that's the only time that uh, I opted to let the backup swimmer take the rest of the, the shift. Um, yeah, it was a little tore up after that one. Damn, but, man. But holy smoke. So, yeah, see, those, <laughs> those are the ones that you remember. <laughs> um, but... Uh, what else we got? Um, oh, the infamous perfect storm. The perfect storm. The perfect storms, like the movie. Um, we did a couple cases during the perfect storm. Uh, <laughs> this one definitely sticks in my mind. Is uh, this? <laughs> this was the one time. I mean, I've had other things, but that's this was the one time that I thought, "Oh, this is it." You know, <laughs> this this is where I. I go meet my maker. Um, you know, that that's go. a big statement right there. Just just for like, if people don't understand how big this statement is, there, there's a lot of us out there that have, have been in the aircraft and you're like, holy cow, that, that was close. Uh, the fact that you're saying it right now is like, come on, baby. <laughs> and I think it is. I think, I think almost every swimmer, I'm sure, probably has that one time, you, you know, they're like, wow, this is... You know, this might be it, but we got uh, launched out on a, um, in the middle of this humongous storm, you know, it's, I didn't even think something like that, you know, existed, um, but this massive storm, uh, we got called out for a, a crewman had, was thrown off the flying bridge of this big cargo ship, and um, so we launch on it, and I mean, it's, the weather was just insane. Uh, the wind and the rain and, and, you know, so we get out there, we, we come up on this huge monster cargo ship and, uh, you know, this thing is just rolling. And if you've never seen it, it's hard to imagine that a ship so huge could just be tossed around and roll like this you know in the ocean i mean you're just used to these monster ships being like stable yeah but this thing was just rocking so uh we can see you know the 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 victim the survivor down there you know laying on the deck and and there's one person you know you know with them so they you know they're going to lower me down and uh assess them and and whatever so I'm, I'm going down to the ship and as you know, and of course it's again, 
blowing wind, blowing rain and, and crazy. So I, I, as soon as my feet touched the deck, I slipped out of the collar and <laughs> almost simultaneously, I slip out of the collar. The ship takes a really wild uh, roll to port, uh, starboard side. My feet flew out from underneath me. My arms in the air. I hit the deck and I'm sliding towards the edge. Oh my God. And, and I just remember I, I'm looking and at the edge of the ship, there's maybe, maybe a, a little six foot, I mean, six inch ledge. Yeah. And there's, there's posts about eight feet across with a, you know, a little chain. And of course I'm right smack in the middle of those two posts Holy and shit. chains, you know, above me. And I just remember thinking, it's like everything just slowed down. And I remember thinking, I'm like, oh God, this is, I don't know which is going to be worse, hitting the water and it's just going to hurt from falling from this height or, you know, well, it's going to suck me under. Am I going to drown first? Am I going to be chopped up by the blades of this thing? Oh my but God. It was... I mean, in my mind at that time, I'm like, there's no way I'm not going off the side of this thing. And I'm not even in swimmer gear. I'm in my flight suit, helmet, you know, and I'm like, this is, this is it. I'm going off the edge and you don't come back from falling off the side of a cargo ship in this storm. <laughs> so, um, I, I remember coming down and, and I was coming up on that little ledge. And again, my feet were in the air. And, um, and it's weird because when I was on SWAT, we, we had this uh, lecture from this colonel in the army and he was telling you how, when you get in a firefight, your vision closes in and you get tunnel vision to the thing that's most important and right in front of you yeah. and, and you lose your peripheral, whatever. And it's weird that I'd heard that story or that instruction later on because it sort of helped my brain understand what happened that day, but as I was sliding to the edge, the only thing you know, it just zoomed in and uh, I saw my one leg going over the side and, you know, I, I just sort of slammed my right foot down. And the only thing I saw was like the bottom of my heel and the top of that ridge, you know, connecting. And it slowed me down just enough because I was still, even with that, I was still going over. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't reach the chain, but it slowed me down just enough that, that the ship started rolling the opposite way. Holy and, shit. And it, it stopped me from sliding and I started going the other way. At that point, I was able to, you know, <laughs> crab walk back and uh, get up. And, and it was one of those things that, you know, at the moment, I'm like, okay, I'm up. I still got a mission to do. You know, so I got up and, and went over and, and checked the guy out. He had a broken back, uh, signal for a litter pickup. They sent down the litter, you know, myself and this other guy sitting here in this crazy weather in this rocking ship, getting this guy with a broken back, backboard and into the litter and up to the helo. And then, uh, you know, they, they took me up. And again, you know, I just took care of him and went back to the, to the hospital and then back to the air station. But, you know, not till after the fact that you start thinking about it and putting everything together, like, wow, that, that almost sucked. <laughs> 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 almost. But, uh, Holy cow. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, we got back to the air station and uh, almost immediately launched on uh the air force helicopter that went down and oh shore, yeah um where the pj was lost right so we launched a search for him and and we searched for him the rest of the night and uh i actually ended up going out to uh cape may and and just did you know flights for the next week or two looking for him Dang. and obviously i mean everybody knows you know never yeah. did find him unfortunately no. Right. But, uh, you know, so spent a lot of time flying around in that crazy storm. Holy but, smoke. But <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, that was my big oh, crap, it's over moment. But luckily, yay, still here. 
<laughs> oh, dude. Holy smoke. <sighs> you know, it's stories like this. I, I get beside myself. I Wow. Can, we, and, we, have, we have one hell of a job. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. But, you know, I, uh, I went to traded it. And, of course, it's one of those ones that, I mean, to this date that I'm I, several times, I'm like, God, I wish I hadn't got out. I wish I'd finished my time there. But, <laughs> you know, it was, yeah, you know, life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so right out, like after that, you got out and joined the police department. And then SWAT, uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine you were in SWAT for as long as you were and not had something go down where you're called for like LE stuff and just like, I know, I know there's something there. You're like, I, I can't really talk about it, but <laughs> what happened was. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, luckily I never had, you know, never had to, to shoot anybody anything like that but um you know well, several call outs lots of lots of you know high risk drug warrants um you know we we did we had a a hostage situation we'd gone out on um a husband had sort of lost his mind and was holding his wife uh, hostage and we get out there we deploy and uh, I'm, I'm in the backyard, basically, uh, you know, behind this big tree. And, you know, I'm watching the back of the house, one corner of it. And, you know, it's an older style house. So there was actually a um, sort of big overhang over the back porch patio area. So, you know, we're, we're standing out there, you know, we're on, on guard and, um, you know, hostage negotiators are doing their thing, trying to talk this guy out. And at some point in the evening, it was um, uh, a couple hours into it, maybe. And we see the back window open up. You know, I'm on the radio. I'm like, you know, we got movement in the back, windows opening up. And the wife had managed to, to get away from him. And she's crawling out the back window onto this, you know, porch roof you know overhang and she gets out there and i'm on the radio it's like you know hostages on the roof hostages on the roof you know we're gonna try to move in to get her and he comes out the window and he's got this big butcher knife in his hand and um you know he's looking around and he looks over he sees her and he turns and he's going over, he's raising the knife, and he starts to, like, arms coming down. He's getting ready to stab this lady. I'm like, oh, crap. So, you know, <laughs> I, I jump out from behind, you know, my cover. I hit the light on my MP and light him up. And I'm like, you know, just, you know, police. And, you know, like, just before he stabs this poor lady, you know, he looks over, sees me. You know, I'm already, like, my finger's pulling the trigger on this guy. And he like dives back inside the window. And, um, you know, right then, I mean, a couple other guys ran up and, and, you know, threw a ladder up and they were able to run up and grab her real quick and get her to safety. You know, and from that point, you know, we just started loading the place up with gas and, and got them out. But, you know, it was funny because we, I was talking to our sniper afterwards and, you know, he was like, holy crap, dude, it's like, Thank God you jumped out and yelled when you did because he's like, I was pulling the trigger. I was squeezing. I'm like, yeah, me too. Oh and, my God. You know, so luckily, I mean, it's just one of those things like, you know, luckily we didn't have to do anything, but it was definitely that, ah, oh, crap moment. Here it is. But um, yeah, it's a little something fun, you know. <laughs> oh, something fun. Listen to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, man. So, you know what? That, that goes to show that the, uh, the rescue side of things is not just like helicopters and stuff. I mean, you just saved that lady's life hands down. That That's incredible. That's awesome. Good job. For you guys, I, I love the boys in blue. You know, I'm supporting them all, you guys. I, I think it's great, everything that you guys do. So, Awesome. Thanks, sir. Yeah, heck yeah. 
Well, I'll tell you what, man. I, dude, I'm all about good advice. And and you had mentioned it earlier that, that Butch Fife had kind of given you some <laughs> words of wisdom, which he might have uh, oh, yeah. put on to me a couple things, one or two things that I that I have in my head from Butch Fife. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that Butch Fife is words of wisdom have gone to so many of us. Yeah. Well done, Butch. <laughs> So, um, what would you pass on to everybody else that Mighty Butch has said to you? Ah, uh, well, this is, it was, <laughs> at the time it wasn't so much fun or funny, but, um, you know, looking back, uh, my words of wisdom to anybody going into this field, especially this field, but in life in general, is, uh, and I'm going to tell you how I came about this little tidbit, but um, the simple fact, don't quit don't ever quit and don't quit don't quit and you know i think as a rule of thumb it's our our personas is none of us are by nature are quitters um you know in the field but i tell you what we had one one day during during swimmer school we had just finished ptn and it was it was a good solid pt and we were out on our run and we, we'd gone down to the beach and we were doing, you know, semi-submerged push-ups. We were doing duck walks in the sand, a good baker's dozen sugar cookies. Yeah, you know? come on. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we, we did the whole routine at the beach and, and then we're going to run through the woods and we're going through the obstacle courses in the woods. You know, again, all while being ground to a pulp with all the sand in every crevice. <laughs> Um, you know. it causes a little chafing <laughs> yeah just a little <laughs> so i remember we had just come out of the woods um up sort of close to the entrance to east city and and we were running and um it was just it was a combination of that massive workout i'm like i'm beat i'm just man it's the brick wall i'm i'm hitting it I got nothing left and, and I started slowing down just a little bit, you know, I was falling a little bit behind. I'm like, whew, it's like, you know, I just, I just need a couple steps. I just need to walk for a couple steps and I'll be good. And I don't think I made it to my second walking step. When, and I don't even know where Butch came from, but Butch just magically appeared <laughs> in my face, <laughs> explaining in true Butch form that you don't quit. You don't ever quit. If we quit, people die. He's like, if you need to slow down a little bit to catch your breath, then you slow down a little bit. But you don't ever stop. You never, ever, ever quit. Again, you quit, people die. And um, those words of wisdom immediately were just implanted in the subcortex of my brain. And uh, needless to say, I finished out that run and never again during school or anything else did I ever fall back. I never quit. Uh, during the school, Pensacola, uh, foot chases in the police department fights in the police department god we fought a lot of people um just every time you, you start getting you know little it's like man butch was like in my head you don't quit you never quit and i tell you what my entire life it's i have that i don't quit attitude now it's i, I don't care if it's a business decision if it's whatever you know it's just butch instilled in me that day that you never quit no matter what um and i'd actually i learned from a seal later on way later on that when you're when you're working out and and you're hitting the wall and you're like that's it i'm exhausted your body's only really at about 40 percent spent yep so you know to 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 use uh you know Dave's words, you know, your body achieves what the mind believes. And, yeah. Come on, Dave Gray. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, my brother, he, he hit it. Um, 
but it's true, you know? And so from that point on, thanks to brother Butch, um, I never did. I never had the inkling to quit again because he was right there in my brain, you know, <laughs> don't quit. So, you know, I think I was actually the first person to ever make that face, you know, uh, Facebook group for swimmers. And, um, you know, whenever we get somebody new, it's like, Hey, I want to be a swimmer. What's your advice? What can I do? You know, that's, that's the biggest thing that I always emphasize to these, you know, new people that want to do our job. It's, you know, above all, don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. Just that. Don't no. quit. It's you know, a, it is a, to. it's a mindset that you have to have, you know, another shout out to the rescue swimmer podcast, uh, rescue swimmer mindset, but I'll tell you, it's, it is a mindset, no matter how you look at it. Yeah. You cannot, there's no option to quit is not there. It's not an option. Right. Right. Ever. And so, Butch's words reign true because if you quit, they die. Right. If, if you stop, exactly. if you can't do it, they're going to die. Right. So, I mean, in those cases that I did, you know, I could have sat there and was like, well, this was too hairy. <laughs> I'm done. Get yeah. Me out. You know, yeah. Now, the thought never crossed my mind at that point. It was just, you got a job to do. You can't quit. Get it done. Yeah. So, and that's, that's, that's what I hear with all these other swimmers that come on your show and, yeah, they don't quit. It's nope. not what we do. It's not what we do. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> hey, you know what? That is why there's only a 40% graduation rate for rescue swimmer school. That is a true statement. Because they, yeah, they're a true statement. They quit. Guys, girls, people go in thinking, oh, I can do this. And their mindset is not there. And they're like, oh, I can end this tomorrow. Just quit. And they do. The rest of us, yeah. we don't quit. No, nope, don't quit. Yeah. And again, it carries on for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Dan. Oh, dude, you are the man. I, I like, I can't thank you enough for coming on, man. Uh, if you, if you got any more stories, I'll take them. <laughs> uh, nothing exciting. I've got a funny story. <laughs> oh, dude. You know what? Let's end it on a funny story. I love funny stories. I love ending it on like everybody <laughs> laughing their ass off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to withhold the names of the other people to uh <laughs> i'm okay with that too <laughs> you, you'll understand but uh <laughs> we'll end on a good funny one um we 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 were going to an air show down at cherry point south carolina and um so we're again we're we're in the h3 at the time so we fly down Cherry Point. We got a couple hours before it's our time for, you know, to do our thing for the air show. And um, what we were going to do basically is uh, I was going to ride out with a 41 footer. Helicopter is going to come in. They're going to lower the hook, pick me up, pull me up. Boom. There's our show, folks. Woo and yeah, you know, <laughs> woo. So, you know, I'm just, uh, I, I'm in my wetsuit, but you know, I've got my helmet on and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going in the water. So, but, but we land and we got some time to kill. We're like, Hey, let's go find someplace here on the base, get something to eat. So, you know, we find the cafeteria and their, their special for the day was chili dogs. Now that's going to be important later in the story. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> <laughs> So the whole flight crew, pilots, flight mech, avionics, we we're all chowing down on these chili dogs. And, and um, you know, then we, we get our stuff together and we're like, all right, you know, let's go do our thing. And I go meet with the boat guys and, and you know, they go to the helicopter and get ready. So <laughs> I go out on the small boat and I'm sitting back there and, you know, and the announcer you know basically explaining what's going to happen <laughs> and then the helicopter comes in you know and he's he's flying over us and we're we're keeping pace hooks coming down and uh you know, i hook up and you know just like everything's supposed to go they pull me up off the deck <laughs> and i get maybe six feet above the water and i'm starting to go back down i'm like wait a minute what's what's going on? Hey, you know, my feet are hitting the water. Now I'm knee deep, waist deep. You know, and I'm like, what the heck? 
and you know now i'm completely under the water you know at this point i'm like all right if this was a joke it was funny till i have to like replace everything in my <laughs> helmet now <laughs> you know? i'm like i'm sort of mad actually <laughs> and um you know and of course the helicopter's still in forward flight i'm underneath so at this point like they're dragging me through the water and <laughs> You know, I like flip on my back. So like the water is cascading over the front of my helmet. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> and I'm like thinking, should I like disconnect? Is this going to look weird for the show? <laughs> I'm like, And then finally, I, I was jerked out of the water. <laughs> and I'm going up, you know, and, and uh, the flight mech, get name withheld, um, gets me to the door and pulls me in. And, you know, again, I'm like, not cool, dude. What the hell? And, you know, I get in. <laughs> And I unhook and, you know, I'm, of course, my ICS and my helmet's dead now. So I go back to my, to the, to my seat in um, the H3. And all I remember was this god awful smell in the helicopter. <laughs> and it, if you've ever flown in an H3, when the cabin doors open, all the air just blows to the back of that helicopter helicopter like you know a wind tunnel which by the way really sucks in the middle of winter when they open the door and you're sitting back there <laughs> but so all this horrendous air is like shooting back to me and i'm like i'm like oh my god i'm getting nauseous and of course i still want to know what happened so you know i i get up we're we're flying back to the air station at this point so i go up to the flight mech and i'm like yelling in his ear i'm like a, what happened? And B, what is that smell? <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me and he's shaking his head like, I'm so sorry, Dan. God, I'm so sorry. And he's like, those chili dogs hit. And I only can focus on one thing. <laughs> he's like, either I was clamping my butt shut and holding it in or pulling you up. And I was trying not to poop. <laughs> so and he stands up and he's like, I chose you, man. <laughs> and he turns around. <laughs> the whole back of his flight suit is brown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like looking and I'm like, I'm busting. I'm like, all right, it's all good. <laughs> so we get back to East City, we land. Why we're still moving, taxiing in, he jumps out of the helicopter and he's running sideways with his back to the hangar because the you know the, the cruise is standing out there to start you know cleaning the halo oh. and he's like running sideways back to the crew quarters. They don't want anybody to see him, <laughs> but um, yeah, so so apparently the old chili dogs they kicked in and and he was trying really hard to contain them and and uh, he sort of lost focus of where I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's fantastic. So yeah, I, I can't and won't disclose his name, but that's uh, <laughs> a memorable experience. <laughs> oh <laughs> man, I'll tell you what, that I could ask for a better way to end this episode, man. Dan <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and sharing these stories. U.S. Coast Guard uh, Rescue again. Swimmer number 139 right here, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, we are out of here. Go. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute to like, subscribe, and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page at The Real Rescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember when that SAR alarm goes off, 
Those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.